Bruce, so not only does that extend to reviewing the annual plan, but the annual plan that we had to pull together prior to Christmas was pretty difficult with a whole lot of uh, price pressures in there. Yeah. So I, I thought that was one of the most difficult annual plans, but having to do this in this uh, uncertain environment yeah. uh, has been yeah. really difficult. Yeah. Uh, can I just interrupt for a second? I see we're live streaming on YouTube. Is that meant to be so? I thought it was public excluded. Uh, uh, no, so, so um, yeah, so um, yeah, Councillor Brown, we we have got a couple of public excluded items at the end, but the yeah, but we do have an open meeting at the at the front end, mm. yeah. But um, yes, but we have gone gone to live, and actually, it is it is um, now two o'clock, and um, yeah, we do have all six members um, present, Bruce. Brilliant, and um, that also means, by the way, Andrew, I think at the stage when we break for public excluded, we will take a short break because I think I just need to confirm that. Uh, um, the live streaming uh, has stopped appropriately for all of us um, and we've got the right people in the room. So, so there we go. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for everybody um, uh, tuning up. That's great. And particularly for staff as well. Um, uh, is anybody suffering from Zoom fatigue? Don't put your hand up because we're about to go into a meeting. But if you are suffering from Zoom fatigue, a bit of, a bit of um, uh, feeling from me as well, because I, I, it's, it's amazing what the new normal is like. Um, as we go into these meetings, but it's also uh, a blessing because we can actually get to see each other and keep things going in these extenuating circumstances. So um, I guess welcome. Uh, if this isn't the Audit and Risk Committee, we are in the wrong room and the wrong meeting, but I can assure you it is. And we, we it, it is an extraordinary meeting. And I appreciate, uh, uh, Ken, you making moves to enable this to happen. Um, I think it is important that when we consider uh, the committee's brief to have that overview of our planning, um, the, the key, well, they're all key items, but the particular items around the annual plan and the long-term plan do need our view now. So I do appreciate the fact that you have facilitated that and that we spend uh, an appropriate, perhaps not too long, but an appropriate time um, just kicking that through. Um, so uh, um, I'm conscious also, uh, members, that that you have been living and breathing this annual plan. Um, so what I would be keen for you to do this afternoon is just to use this as a chance to stand back or sit back and just reflect. It's, you know, there's no decisions to be made. Um, it's not as if you've got to try and work out what the um, the, the rate increase should, be, increase should be, although I think you're probably pretty well settled by the sounds of it. It is the chance just to stand back or sit back, as I, as I should be more correct, just to reflect, have we got it right? Have we got our risks managed? And I think that's the appropriate role um, of this committee. Um, but having said that, I don't want to belittle the fact that um, uh, Leon, welcome Leon, and Kat somewhere, I presume. Um, uh, uh, welcome along as well from our auditors. It's important that we hear from them to conclude the, the final missing piece. There I say it, the fee piece without being too direct. Um, Leon, that was that was missing from the last time we met and obviously the stuff to, to the, the items in public excluded are really, really important. So um, uh, with those sorts of opening remarks and welcome, do I have any apologies? If I could able to stay the time, because I think otherwise we're all here, aren't we? So there are no apologies to be sustained. Great. Um, the matters are reasonably straightforward, but has anybody got a sense that their interests may cut across the matters we have at hand at all? No, I get no, I don't think we've been informed, so that's fine. There are no late items that I have been uh, uh, um, aware of. Is there anything that you need to raise, Gary, uh, either in public or excluded that we, we're not aware of that you can't raise? No, nothing, uh, Mr Chairman. So um, the order will be, um, uh, from uh, my perspective, the order as we have it in, on the order paper. Um, I'd like to move that we uh, confirm that as the order. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Roger. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much. <clears throat> right, so here we go. So confirmation of the minutes um, uh, that we met last on the 9th of March in the old world. Um, uh, it was a meeting which, as the minutes show, was, was substantially truncated 
um, because of the, the unavoidable um, loss of a quorum. Um, but having said that, we're appreciative of reports and the work we got through. Um, uh, uh, are there any matters of fact or accuracy for those of us that were present or even any typos that we need to raise at this stage? I'm happy to move that the minutes be accepted as a true and correct record. Thank you, Claire. That looked pretty good to me. Anybody want to second that, please? Thank you, Roger. Um, you probably were the two that were there with me, which was good. So they seem they seem um, pretty much in order. Uh, um, and I think anything that was uh, on them uh, does come through uh, later in the meeting. Um, so in that case, uh, I'd like to put the motion that we uh, receive and adopt these minutes. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much for that, Claire, and uh, it's good. Radio. So uh, we're into uh, the first of the, um, uh, the the key bits in this time around the 2021 annual plan. As I said, I encourage you to use this as a chance to stand back. And um, Kirsty, is it? If I've seen Kirsty somewhere, they're going to lead us off, or is this you, Ken? Uh, uh, no, look, look, I'm re really happy for this um, to go to Kirsty, um, but but just supporting your your remarks a little earlier, um, Bruce, that, that that the focus here is um is really on the underlying assumptions, um, much more so than you know where we're landing in, term, in terms of the numbers. Um, yeah. That yeah, I mean, quite clearly that exercise is, is happening as as referred to in the in the paper, but um yeah, but um yeah, this is much more about the underlying assumptions and, and where we're at um yeah from from a risk perspective. So um. Yeah, Kirsty, Kirst, very happy for you to, to take us through the report. Oh, Kirsty, oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? No, uh, we can hear you, but very faintly. So, so I suspect it's a volume. Yeah, I've had to move because the man who's in my room, so my apologies, probably not the best situation. Uh. Um, yeah, no, looks, looks sadly we can't, or at least I, I can't, so I, so I assume nobody else can. Yeah, you are very, very faint. Okay, bear with me, I'm going to move back. Oh. Oh, actually, um, so, I, so I think she said she was just going to shift to a different room in the house. Um, yeah, actually, Kirsty was presenting to a workshop session this morning, and there were absolutely no problems with volume at that point. So, <laughs> hope, hope, hopefully, we'll be sorted very soon. Nice dulcet tone, unlike my voice. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Can you hear me now? Uh, uh, yes, Kirsty, that is much, much better. My apologies. Why I moved was because the man is here to mow my lawns, and I didn't want you to be interrupted by that noise. So that could disrupt. Um, so I'll try and move quickly. Um, so just in terms of where we're at, um, so that Sarah Davies, the Manager of Finance, reported to this committee back on the 9th of March to provide an overview as to the key assumptions that underpin the 2018-28 LTP and how they needed to be updated in light of the development of the 2020-21 draft annual plan. Um, so in, in reporting, Sarah spoke specifically to those key assumptions that were deemed to be of priority, and they related to growth, impact on rates, revaluation of non-current assets, borrowing and investment interest rates, changes in legislation, depreciation and inflation. I'm not proposing to go through and tell you what Sarah reported um, at that point. I'm assuming that you have read the reports from the 9th of March and um, for the meeting today. Um, but as you're aware, we went out and publicly notified our draft annual plan on the 23rd of March, being the day that the Prime Minister announced we were moving into Alert Level 3, and obviously we moved into Alert Level 4 two days later. Um, the, at that point, we didn't know the, the true impacts of COVID-19 on the New Zealand economy and or the global economy, but the impacts have been far-reaching. Um, and to ensure that we better understood those, we engaged Brad Olson from Infometrics to provide us with his expert economic advice as to the impacts 
likely impacts on the Wai power economy. So attached to this report is the key pieces of um, advice that he has provided to Wai Power District Council, um, being a general overview, having had a um, look at the LTP assumptions, and then providing advice as to the impacts on the Wai Power economy specifically. Um, that work has underpinned a comprehensive review undertaken by staff um, to revisit our 1920 and 2021 um, budgets, looking at operating expenditure, capital expenditure, and the Capital Works Programme, and also revenue. And so um, outlined in the report are the guiding principles that were um, worked on with elected members and approved by the executive team to provide guidance to the budget managers in, in revisiting those budgets. Um, just one point to make that when we um, provided those, we were acting on the assumption that there would, we would be in level four um, and that suspended capital works would not recommence this financial year. Obviously, we moved through alert levels um, quicker than anticipated and the timing for the recommencement of Capital Works was addressed as part of a further revisit of the Capital Works programme um, in more detail. So that's referred to in the paper also. Um, we had another look at the Capital Works programme, determining what was critical, um, what was priority, what had already been um, committed to by way of contract, um, and what was really able to be delivered and um, affordable for our communities. So I guess that gets us to the point that we're at now where I'd like to provide an update on those key assumptions um, that are now underpinning the, the work that we're doing in terms of revisiting the annual plan. Um, and, the, and the point that has been earlier made with elected members is that this is a fast moving environment. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty still in play here across our business and beyond. And so in all likelihood, whatever assumptions we adopt now um, are likely to be proven to be incorrect at a future point in time. It's acknowledged also that decisions made through the annual plan for 2020-21 could have a significant impact, particularly on year one of the 2021-31 long-term plan. And so it's critical that we exercise um, caution and be prudent in terms of what we, we take forward um, and adopt um, later in, in June. So just in terms of now providing you, um, talking, walking you through um, those key assumptions, the first one that we um, identified as needing to be updated was growth impact on rates. And this is a backward um, looking rather than a future focused um, measure. So what we're saying is that expected growth in rates is now 3.25%, um, up 27 from the draft annual plan. Um, this is not an assumed figure, it's a real figure. It's based on properties that have been entered into the rating system since the revaluation mm. and which quotable value has valued in the past two months. So there may be further properties that come on um, stream prior to the end of this financial year, but we've been conservative and have um, based the figure on what we know as at today. Um, so then we move on to the, the next assumption being revaluation of non-current assets, and there's no change to what was provided back in March. For borrowing and investment rates, um, this is one that has changed. So we have adjusted this from 2.5% in the draft annual plan to 1.5%, and that's based on advice from our Treasury advisor, Earl White of Bancorp Treasury Services Limited. With regard to changes in legislation, there is no change to the update provided on the 9th of March. Um, we assume there would be no changes in legislation other than those that had previously been signalled. So, for example, we are well, well aware of um, possible changes in the water services area and also in terms of RMA amendment. Um, they are already on our radar. With regard to depreciation, um, there was no change to this assumption um, on how it was calculated for the draft annual plan. 
um, there will be a small adjustment to the depreciation value due to the timing of capital projects. Um, however, there has been no change to eroding depreciation from the update provided in March. And in respect of inflation, um, that was removed from the draft annual plan as a means of reducing the impact on the proposed rates increase, so therefore there is no change um, to the update provided in March in respect of inflation. For revenue, um, we, are, we are now forecasting a significant decline in non-rates revenue. And the assumption that we've relied on for revisiting the draft annual plan is an 18% decline in residential and non-residential construction. So that will apply in respect of building consents, resource consents, and also it's been applied in respect of development contributions. Um, this is based on advice provided to us by Infometric. It is a conservative figure and that um, it relates to timing. So this is based on a March year end, and, and obviously the annual plan runs from 1st of July through to 30 June. So um, the advice from Infometrics is that if we were to adopt that July to June timing, in fact, that decline would drop back to something like 5%. Again, their advice was adopt a conservative approach and, um, and rely on that 18%. Um, so in terms of therefore where to from here, um, we, we are continuing to have information provided to us by Infometrics that will be updated um, periodically. We are also sourcing information from alternative um, providers. So for example, um, the advice and guidance coming out of the local government COVID-19 response unit, um, also Tiwaka. Um, so they have access to economic data provided to them through the economist um, engaged by Waikato Regional Council. Um, and there is also, we've accessed data through the Solgum um, Community Wellbeing um, Service, Data Service. And that is information that we have subscribed to to help inform the development of the long-term plan, but it will have relevance here in terms of the annual plan and the implementation of our work programs moving forward. Um, with regard to assessment um, against comply or to ensure compliance with legislative requirements, so moving forward, we are required to assess compliance with the draft annual plan, the long-term plan, um, the revenue and financing policy, and also our significance and engagement policy. And so. The, the timing has been really tight. We're still working through the development of a revised annual plan, um, but we are satisfied that where we're at currently, um, that, that we, we don't foresee a need to go back out to our community and further consult. But we, we are, I guess, gathering data, looking at detailed budgets across all activity areas of our business, and we will be taking independent legal advice if we, we identify a need to do so. Um, I guess that just, we remain in a holding pattern and a watching brief there um, as we, we get more clarity around um, the figures. In terms of the process from here, um, so we are looking to, um, we have scheduled a, an extraordinary um, strategic planning and policy meeting for the 9th of June and the purpose for that is to bring back um, a revised plan to elected members in a formal setting for them to provide feedback and for changes to be made ahead of adoption of the annual plan on the 30th of June um, that's scheduled to be adopted by council to comply with the legislative requirements. Um, we, are, we have scheduled hearings and um, deliberations for submissions on the annual plan. They will take place on the 26th and 27th of May. Um, they will likely be held um, via Zoom. And we're just checking in with those submitters that wish to be heard as to whether they are able to be available via Zoom. Um, we've got 42 submissions. Of those, 12 wish to present. And of the eight of those that have been contacted, eight have confirmed that they are able to participate remotely via Zoom. 
Um, so that's probably enough of an overview from me, but I'm very happy to respond to any questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kirsty. That's very um, uh, good, very thorough, and I do appreciate uh, that update. And as I said to folk, uh, I'm a bit ad nauseum here. Um, you've probably heard a chunk of this, so I think even as late uh, as late as this morning, if I got that right, Ken. So it is a four counts just to be able to sit back from a risk perspective. Have we got a, a timetable that's credible, and have we got a um, uh, have we got our assumptions in the right area? that you will feel comfortable gives you say a soft landing the ability to make a decision in june as kirsty's outlined bear in mind the last decision you have to make my my bit of advice bit of a lecture is you have to make certain that the total plan is financially prudent which is probably taking something of a um a slightly longer term view than just the immediate year um, uh, um, and that's the other thing that you've got to do. So come 30th of June, have you got the best information um, and, and, and risks managed and are you prudent and can you go ahead and make a decision would be the key things. So uh, with that sort of opening comment, if there's any questions, I'd be really keen to hear what they might be or comments at this stage, please. You're probably meeting down, are you? Yeah, go clear. Uh, no. yeah. oh, sorry. No, I was just, just going to say, Bruce, is, in terms of some of our assumptions, is it <clears throat> is it more appropriate that we actually have a, a band and a high, medium, low sort of assessment? Because some of them we, we may be able to uh, um, give a bit more, I suppose, flex in there to be responding to changes when they start to occur, because things are just... Yeah, everyone's saying it. They're happening rapidly. And even just at lunchtime, I read the latest news and we've got two big bunning stores in the district that are closing down. Wow. One in Tim, one in Cambridge, you know. So, uh, and that would have been a business that I would have thought would have been viable, but obviously mm -hmm. isn't. So those things are just going to keep, keep hitting us, I think, for the next, at least for the next couple of months. And um, yeah, so I, I'm just... Yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, assumptions that have been made with the best intentions, but uh, should we be having a more positive and a, a more negative <laughs> uh, uh, number in there as well to look at as comparisons? That's a good question, and I would like to ask Kirsty or, or Gary or Ken or somebody to respond to that. Um, so, I mean, if I could just characterise it, it's actually what is the, what is the certainty that we have around these assumptions? Um, and in terms of uh, what risks we should bring to bear. It might also raise, Jim, what do we anticipate going forward into the new year we would do to monitor um, what could be what you're highlighting as a very mobile economy in the sense of uh, changes. Dynamic would be a better word than mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. And with our inability to have flex once well, are very difficult to change our plan once it's set. So, you know, we really do need to be conservative, otherwise we're really going to get caught. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 look, I'll um, perhaps some um, speak to that um, with, with your indulgence, um, Chair. So, um, yeah. So, 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 look, I guess um, very much in our um, in our thinking as we've um, as we've been been working with the elected members in terms of putting this annual plan together. Is that um, yeah? Is that we we base it on the on the best information that we've got available to us? Um, it, as as Kirsty said, we've um, yeah we, we we have gone to um to to Infometrics and we have gone to um to Bancorp and in, in terms of um you know treasury related information, um, base that on the best information um yeah possible um yeah we we've also um I guess um to to a certain extent as as Kirsty referred to we've um yeah we've actually based that quite um quite conservative conservatively as well. So um yeah so so look I think we're in the situation where we where what we've shaped up is is best information um, possible. Um, but but I think the other key to it and, and this uh, this is something actually that um yeah the, the chief executive has had some engagement with our councillors on is, is is having a very good um you know monitoring regime. Um, yeah we, we we are certainly in a um in a period of um of considerable uncertainty. So um yeah so so I know um yeah that, that Gary has been um has been talking to the councillors about making sure that we have some really robust 
monitoring mechanisms in place um, so that we can be aware um, of, of, yeah, of, 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 yeah, of, of anything that has, has changed unexpectedly. Um, and, we, and we obviously will, will be able to be onto that on a timely basis to, to make the relevant adjustments. So um, yeah, and, and, and in fact, obviously, we would need to be um, need to be doing that anyway, um, because um, you know the fo very much the focus of the next year is is obviously on um, on our LTP document, um, which, which needs to be adopted by thirty June of, of next year. Um, so um, yeah, so so the monitoring regime is important for a couple of reasons. Um, once to once you know immediately um, to be able to take um take take action in the current year. Um, and, and B to to inform our um, our decision making in terms of where we land um, the LTP. Mr. Chairman, perhaps I could also comment. I I did look at suggesting to the team we needed to um, pull together some high, medium, and low scenarios based around these assumptions. But when you turn your mind to um, the sorts of things that can flex in this current environment, um, there's going to be a budget announcement on Thursday, which could turn this thing on its head. Um, there could be uh, an upsurge in COVID numbers, which will have a dramatic impact on our economy. There could be a vaccine, which could be the saviour for everyone. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of the Australian bubble and what that'll do to our tourism economy. So there are so many unknowns uh, what, what we have done is we've taken a conservative approach and to the extent that we might be wrong, we've also suggested to council that they retain a significant um, cash reserve so that um, when it comes in particular to year one of the next LTP, they've got a buffer in there to work with. Mm. And the other thing that we've suggested is... Um, uh, We've been struggling with how on earth we fund a recovery package and uh, the council has been working quite um, diligently to um, uh, make the best of its balance sheet by making money through arbitrage arrangements and so there's about $890,000 that council set aside from arbitrage and, uh, and we've had a chat to the council this morning and, and thought that um, a really good opportunity exists for us to develop a robust recovery package that's in conjunction with um, the wider region and bring that back to the council for consideration as part of this annual plan package. So yeah, um, difficult to do high, medium and low sort of growth scenarios because at, at the end of the day, that'll be small bear if uh, any of those other things that influence the course of this pandemic come to pass. Mm -hmm. So the critical, the critical question that that because I think Jim, you can see your good question is right, sort of goes right to the heart of what we're of what we're trying to do here, which is create a forecast, which um, by its very defin definition is going to have uncertainties. Um, and and I think I think what I would take out of what you're saying, Gary, uh, isn't I mean effectively it's not different to what you're saying, Jim, that even if you choose to make a decision in June. Um, uh, um, which is complying with the law. Well done. Uh, is 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 still an exercise and a forecast, and there could there could be an in fact greater variables to do it. The question is, is there any reason you want to try and hold open? Say, um, and it's not. Other councils are not going into July, which of course is breaching the statutory date, but are going to, are going to July not because they necessarily want to hold open, but actually for them the event of actually trying to deal with the expenditure reviews, the CapEx reviews, the, the, the assessments have become so difficult for them, they need, to, they need that time. Um, so I think the question that I, I, I'm wanting to perhaps first address that of really in some sense, which has come out of yours, Jim, you're comfortable that you will have as good as information as you can have come that mid-June point when, when, quite frankly, the numbers have got to stop and you've got to make a decision, do we run with this plan or don't we? Yeah, I, I suppose I said, yeah, I suppose so, Bruce. I, uh, just looking at safest for us to go for argument's sake with the infometrics advice that we're getting, because it's the most pessimistic. 
Um, yeah, people say that, don't they? They seem to make it a badge of honour, which is uh, yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. probably supports Gary's view. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and look, I don't, I don't uh, disagree with them, but you know, when you look at uh, the Treasury advice for argument's sake, well, you can't say that they're um, uh, overly optimistic group of people either. So, um, we are erring on the side of safety, and is that actually causing us more grief than than need be? But look, that's I'm certainly comfortable at that point rather than going the other way and and undershooting. Mm. Yeah. Bruce, so, sorry, I'm going to say we're probably sorry. If somebody's going to speak. I should shut up. Oh, Andrew. Andrew, go for it, mate. Uh, yeah, look, I, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, this morning's presentation, I think, was definitely erring on the side of conservatism and um, as is typical of our executive and I, I, they're fiscally very responsible, fortunately. Um, I also want to say that we are dealing with every every annual plan or long-term plan never comes to fruition exactly. That's just a, a, a factor of looking into the future. This particular one, um, there are so many huge variables in play that um, it would be unrealistic to expect it to be anything but more uh, divergent, I suppose, going forward. <clears throat> and, I, and I totally agree with you. We, we, if, if there's any reason to um, delay making the decision, then we should, but we, uh, that is only if there's a reason that we can foresee. Um, I, I think our team has been working extraordinarily hard to come up with, with the plan that they have. And um, un unless um, th there's, there's a, a plainly um, evident major factor coming into play like a major government announcement or, or something similar um yeah I, I think we're in a position to tie this one up before the end of june um yeah i also want to say i, I think our um our our, our uh, community here probably is still not really come to terms with with what 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 our future is going to hold um, hearsay only, but I did hear that yesterday a, a, a friend's daughter was looking at buying a house in Fraser Street in the 400s that needed an awful lot of work, 400,000 I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and um, it's got multi-offers on it already, came on the market like I believe only a couple of days ago. So that's, I guess, indicating that um, people have still got confidence in our area but things like Bunnings closing, that's a shock and that's gonna have an impact on our town. And we've got um, empty stores in our main street again, which we haven't had for a long time. So yeah, it's, there's a whole bunch of factors to bring into play here for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And Bruce, could I just, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, I'm hearing what all you're saying. And uh, so one of my, um, hobby horses has been to to get more specific information from YPAR. So look, I love um, Brad Olson and his team at Infometrics. They're, they're fantastic and, and they they tell a compelling story, but it's all high level, you know, um, macro economics. And I'm really keen to get um, an information source from from YPAR businesses. Because you know then we would have we'll have a bit more knowledge perhaps of other people that are thinking about closing as well because um, I'm really concerned about achieving um, I suppose a realistic annual plan that, that is affordable and if you're just going on macroeconomic metrics it's not necessarily going to reflect what is affordable for, for our, our district um, and so I'm really keen that those other sources like Tewaka and I thought um, Debbie mentioned, Debbie LaSalle's mentioned that they, the Chamber of Commerce is, were going to do some surveys of businesses as well. Um, so it'd be really good to hear them because my understanding would be that they would be a key sector and that they're either um, going to shed staff and so create 
um, affordability issues for individual households, or they're the ones where we've got to make sure they take up the government assistance. Because what I've heard in the media is that they're not taking it up. And so that in itself could jeopardize a significant portion of our rating base. So um, yeah, th those, I I'm also conscious that further down the track or maybe at the end of the next 12 months, so still within our annual plan um, cycle, we're going to have a lot of young people that probably aren't going to be able to get employment, um, you know, that are going to graduate at the end of the um, academic year. And I know that in other recessions, there's been a concerted effort locally to place those kids in, in work experience, internships, um, um, environmental projects. And that kind of that would be a really good initiative for council to be seen to be doing, but it takes time to plan it. And it's also something where you collaborate with multi-stakeholders. And it's something that I think we should be, you know, looking into and, and maybe making a plan for now. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting point. Um, I just wonder if we could, uh, sorry, I've inserted myself. Gary, were you going to answer Claire's question? Oh, just, just to an extent, uh, Mr. Chairman, so um, I guess the major part of macroeconomic data is the money supply side um, supplied by Earl White. The data that we rely on from Infometrics around uh, the level of unemployment in WIPA, number of job losses, uh, GDP, that sort of material is very much WIPA specific. Mm. Um, Having said that, absolutely take your point around the need for um, intelligence coming from the WIPAR business community. And to that end, um, we've seconded Steve Tritt into Te Waka for 20 hours per week. Um, Te Waka is actively surveying WIPAR businesses and that sort of intelligence will help inform the recovery package, which uh, Debbie LaSalle's will be bringing back to you in a workshop on uh, on the 20th of May. Um, that's, that's great, Gary. I did notice though that the Tiwaka update we got last week was actually using data that was two weeks old. And I'd really like to be able to have at least, it's only seven days old. You know, like, I, I, can, <laughs> I don't know how difficult it is to produce, produce all these graphs and things. I'm hoping it's simply, um, yeah, computer power in there, but, I'd really like to have a bit more timely feedback on that. Trevor Chair, can I please respond? Um, just to add to what Gary said. So I've been in contact with Steve. I did actually request um, updated information from him for today. Um, what he's advised me is that that will be available on Friday um, to then be able to be shared with elected members. Um, in addition, I referred earlier to the um, that we've made to Solgum Community Wellbeing Data Service, and we will be drilling down into that. There's a significant level of data that is available that is WIPAR specific, including detail as to the uplift of MSD primary benefits. Um, so Haven has now been trained in that, and is, we will be looking at what data sets we're able to access to help inform the further development of the annual plan and leading into the long-term plan. Great. Well, that's comforting. I, I, I hear, oh, sorry, Roger, you got your hand up. Go for me. It's a flow under the bridge yet, isn't it? Real surprise that Bunnings are closing down. Uh, I didn't feel that there was any hint that that would happen in Cambridge and TA. I'm also hearing of a number of small businesses that have already made the decision to close their doors permanently. I think when we get to the end of the wage subsidy, which is what, three weeks time? Uh, I think there are going to be a number of other shocks that we're going to see of businesses just electing not to open. Um, we don't know what the budget's going to hold. We hope that there's going to be some injection uh, to uh, really kickstart us back. And then, of course, there are those shovel readies that we've got in 
to the national agencies whether or not any of those are going to affect us. Um, so I think the, the, that crystal ball that we're gazing into is just so dark and dirty uh, that we're not really having any surety of what is actually going to, to happen. And that, that concerns me. As, as with the other uh, the, around the council this morning, I was quite pleased with, with what was presented there. I did feel that it was conservative. Uh, I did feel it was quite prudent. And I'm so pleased that we didn't go to a zero-based rates increase because I still think that we've got to do what we can to kickstart our economy locally. So that's, um, I, but I'm still concerned about the fact that we just don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of couple of three weeks. Thank you. A Andrew? Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, just talking about infometrics, um, it's certainly pretty grim reading um, looking at that. And, and there's just a bit of an anon anon anonymous, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, if you look at page 40, well, if you go to if on page 46, it's saying that agriculture is the one industry or one of the industries that's going to hold up. But on page 48, they're still predicting job losses in farmers and farm managers of 80 people. And it's, that seems counterintuitive, mm -hmm. should I say. Is there someone who can query that, you know, what's going on in that area? So I can follow up on that part, on that point that you've queried, um, Councillor Brown. Thanks. Some of that, um, Andrew, I think comes down to the predictions that most of the banks are actually coming out with for milk payout going forward. It's mm -hmm. dropping as low as 560 with some banks, 580, 590 with others. So, um, yeah, that, that builds into the system a whole lot of, um, yeah, lack of confidence and doubt. You know, I mean, for example, we've made the decision to um, not undertake herd testing going forward, cutting out those costs. In anticipation of that, we'll probably have 200,000 drop out the bottom of our budgets. So I'm assuming that, you know, if you kind of got the option of do you have that relief milker or do you rear your own calves, you make that decision to keep it at home. So that's where the sensitivity probably comes. So that is, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? We are reflecting strongly that we need to have flexibility going into the new year because of. Um, well, they're actually the known unknowns. Largely, it's I, I hear everybody being uh, quite uh, open to um, possibilities occurring on a spare every front, um, which which is interesting. So it does come back to, and you know, we've, 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 I'm risking going back over old ground. The the, um, the the fact that we do have to set ourselves a position, and and that is, are you comfortable with the data? And you know, it sounds like more or less you're getting there with with one or two questions to come. But it still means how do you, as as governors and Gary and team as managers, focus on that in the new year so that you can uh, be flexible if you can. And perhaps it's a question I want to ask Gary: is what is the capacity within a budget? Which I think what you started what at four percent or something, but you know you're back at two point something percent. What flexibility do you have? Or well, Ken, sorry, that isn't you might want to ask the financial group, I don't know, but I'm I'm open to you. I'm open to either of you guys. I, I, I think um, Gary was about to answer, so I'm yeah, very, very happy to defer to him on this. <laughs> yeah, so so the the biggest variable for our budget is the revenue from non-rate sources. Mm. And um, what I've suggested to council now that we we really do need to work. Um, my key performance indicators for the next year. And I'm suggesting to council that we have um, a really robust reporting framework so that um, we're able to present uh, data to the council yeah. each month about the sorts of things that are going on in the bi-power economy. And critically, if, um, I mean, the useful thing about um, the non-rate revenue is that uh, as that revenue builds up, I'm, I'm able to then deploy resources into that function because it pays for itself. So um, in all other respects, 
the work that we're doing on our core infrastructure is funded, the variable bit is effectively self-funding. So that's that's the flex that I've got in there to build up resource as as the money um, either comes in or dies off. Mm. Uh, could I ask a question, uh, Bruce, of Gary, yeah. about flexibility? Like one of the questions I have about flexibility is if people can't pay their rates, how does council you know, manage that because they, they need the dollars to keep like paying the salaries or getting the work done. I mean, that's the kind of question that I have when I think about flexibility, right? So if you've got say 10% of your rate payer base that can't pay rates, how does council handle it? Like, do you borrow the money or do you put up rates a bit more so that you know you're going to have that money in kitty? Like, because we've never, all the time I've been an elected representative, we've never had this issue because we've had 99% of our rate, you know, pay pay on time. Yeah, thanks for that, Claire. That, that's a really good question. And um, we, what we're told by Infometrics is we expect there to be 2,000 job losses in my power, or, mm -hmm. and that is, I think the economy mm -hmm. would have about 6.9% unemployment. Um, mm. Now, under those circumstances, there are people who are going to struggle to pay their rates. Mm. Um, the question is, is that something that other rate payers should fund or is that something that, um, in terms of that sort of wealth redistribution, uh, we, we look to central mm. government to fund? Mm. Um, now, some of you will have a view on that, but uh, until now, um, for people who have struggled to pay their rates, they tend to rely on uh, assistance from central government for that, that uh, will take off these people to pay those ones sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's, it's whether or not that's going to be an effective mechanism at the scale that might be required. But I guess that's what the budget might help us answer. Um, yeah, certainly. Um, the, in terms of what sort of flex we've got, the, the I guess one of the unknowns from my perspective is that um, governments seem to um, come out pretty quickly with a, here's an opportunity and it might be tree planting, uh, mm -hmm. job creation, and um, in particular, you know, partnering with iwi to get um, work schemes up and running because they tell us that Maori will be most affected by this um, pandemic. And so the sort of flex I've been looking at is how does how do we create flex in our budget so that we can capitalise on opportunities from the crown as they arise, and um, that's one of the reasons I've suggested to you that we need to keep aside um, funds so that um, a we can deal with the recovery package and b we can soften the blow on year one of our LTP. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and just on that, actually, Gary, I thought that uh, something that might be really useful is if, if we could get a calculation of the multiplier effect that is produced in our wider economy if council spends, you know, a million dollars or $1, how, how often will that be re-spent in the community? And so it would be a really great um, messaging for us so that we're aware that if council can be active in, in this kind of stimulus um, area, that we're actually helping a lot more people than just the dollar amount that we're, you know, pumping into it. So that that multiplier, um, you know, like I'm sure economists have have values for it, um, but it it does enable you to say like if we fund something, you know, to a million dollars, it actually generates you know four million dollars in our community or something like that. Yeah, I, I guess that would hold true if if the money is spent locally. Um, we do know that for every dollar that uh, local government spends, uh, central government spends about nine. Mm. So um, from my perspective, Ken, just a, just a query. Um, uh, so uh, allowing for, indeed Gary's good point, who should be the cost of an inability of a ratepayer to um, pay? What are we doing in terms of, um, uh, if anything, uh, enabling ratepayers to pay. And look, I'm, I'm, I think I might have reflected to you a couple of days ago, the last couple of councils I've been working with, rather than ratepayers coming in and saying, um, I can't pay, they're actually saying, can I go on to monthly 
debit, mm-hmm. direct debits, so that I spread my cost, for instance. So it's that sort of thing that I'm, I'm um, raising. The other thing which has certainly been discussed, and you will be well aware of around the traps, is um, it is actually a, a renewed, reinvigorated postponement. Now, admittedly, that still raises a cash issue, um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't take away from the, res- the responsibility of paying for your rates eventually at some point in time. So, um, what, what's happening in that area there from a rates relief, from a, a b- enabling money to come in the door perspective? Yep. Yep. No, that's um, that, that's fine, Bruce. So um, yeah. So so I guess um, council did um turn its mind to this um, you know, very early in the um in the advent of the um of the COVID thing, um, in in relation to the fourth quarter rates instalments um, which, which which obviously have just gone out and, and and actually which are which are due in a couple of weeks time, um, yeah, the the twenty first of um twenty first of May, um, so we turned our attention to it in, in that context and also in regard to some of our water billings. Um, so you know, water billings between now and the end of this um this financial year. Um, so um yeah, so councils certainly um yeah certainly have accommodated um you know, you know cash flow concerns. So 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 our focus was very much on um well, well in fact what what we did do is we reduced the amount of penalty um from the the very much um standard and, and standard right across the country I believe um ten percent penalty um that we dropped that down to um down to um three percent. Um, we also put some other um, mechanisms in place um, that, that would allow um, rate powers of, of both the, those, those, the fourth quarter rates instalment um, as, as well as those, those water bills, um, extended periods um, to, um, to, to pay. So um, yeah, so so we certainly weren't um, weren't reducing the amount of the the rates accounts or the water the water invoices, um, but yeah, but we were certainly um, yeah indicating that um, yeah that um, yeah that, 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 that we were we were very open um, to people having longer longer periods um, to pay. So um, yeah, so that that was put in place. Um, yeah, that only relates to those um, those billings. So um, yeah, so we do need to come back to council um, at, at, at the same time as we um, as we adopt the annual plan um, with um, potential um, yeah, r- rate, rating penalty relief um, go- going forward into, into the new year. Um, so yeah, so certainly the intention of the team to um, yeah to um, yeah to, to do that. Um, in regard to your um, your comment um, about um, yeah about um, about payment arrangements or direct debit um, type arrangements. Um, so so look, um, Waipa already has um, his very um, very high take up of um, of direct um, debit arrangements. Um, my my um, my recollection, certainly the last time I looked at the um, at the stats. Um, was that we're in the high the high sixty percent um, in terms of um, people who have um, chosen to pay their rates bills um, by, by by direct debit. Um, now, 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 in some cases, obviously those are, those are aligned um, to quarterly payments. I mean, I mean, obviously it's at the discretion of the rate payer themselves, um, but but o- often those arrangements are, are aligned to the quarterly instalments, just just so that um, people don't forget to don't forget to pay them. Um, yeah, they 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 choose to take the direct debit option on that basis. Um, but but also in a in a large number of cases, um, yeah, you know, people have already chosen to um, you know, to to run with with monthly direct debits, um, because um, in, in effect, actually, possibly even even more frequently, um, you know, aligning it to um, you know, perhaps a fortnightly pay, etc. Um, yeah, you know, just to, just to obviously make those um, the, those much more bite sized chunks. Um, so so yeah, so pe- people certainly have already um, in, in, in fact, for quite some time, have been taking advantage of those. Um, yeah, our, our our, our rates team is, is certainly very happy to put any arrangement like that into um, into place with with any of our rate pairs if they if they if they choose to um, to avail themselves of that. That's great, yeah, Gary. Uh, there was one other tool that we offered the council to have a look at again this morning, and that was on the back of the changes to the valuations where the residential, commercial, industrial properties went up. And value substantially more than um, than the farm properties, and uh, one of the bits of intelligence we received from Infometrics was that the primary sector was going to do well relative to the rest of the um, economy. Now, on that basis, we do have an opportunity to use um, uh, a provision that's allowed for within our, our revenue and finance policy to slide a bit more 
of the rate onto capital value and a bit less onto the uniform annual charge. So we're going to model that and we're going to show that to the councillors. But equally, you know, we've heard this uh, this afternoon that uh, you know the farmers are indeed having tough times. So um, it's a model that we'll throw up for consideration during the annual plan hearings. Mm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and that's that again is 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 part of the total. All the, it's actually looking at all the levers. It's been a word that I've had around a number of other meetings, Gary. Is that we have to think about all the levers we have rather than anything else. And I might like to come back to that. Um, can I just can I just have a couple of queries about the the assumptions? I take it. Um, I mean, firstly, what we're really saying is this coming year, twenty twenty one, benefits from the you know, notwithstanding the last, the fourth mm -hmm. quarter, the incredibly good growth you've had essentially in the first three quarters of the year, which has been, Gary, I think as you were saying before the meeting astounding. So it's actually going to be the issue for the first year of the LTP. And I think you raised that, Kirsty, as being when the impact, if there's an impact on growth from the current position is really going to take play, right? I think that's essentially what we're saying. I think that's essentially what, um, and the metrics are saying. Can I just ask a question about the assumption around borrowing and borrowing in particular, um, Ken? Um, we're a reasonably new borrower in terms of our in terms of treasury management. So essentially our our total cost of borrowing, or perhaps we even might say our weighted average cost of borrowing can be assessed as relatively low and, and I mean you've had the advice from Earl to go at 1.5 percent correct? I, 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 yes so, so so Bruce just to um just to clarify though that that's not the weighted average that that would be the cost of the new debt um so yeah yeah you know so historically we we do have some some debt that will potentially be at um at higher rates um, but yeah, but 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 our um our the amount of borrowing we've done in the past has has been relatively low. So yeah, mm. yeah. So the influence of that slightly higher price debt is not significant relative to our. No. our so that's really the point I was trying to get. Yes. At. Um, yes. I was. Well, I think I've already told you where I was at, but I mean, Tauranga is substantial debt holder. Um, the ability to bring its weighted average cost. Yes. Down of interest is substantially harder given. Positions that it's taken two, three, four years back, um, uh, uh, which is which is interesting. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So, 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 look. While we do have some historic um, debt, and, and in fact, I um, yeah, we have still got one um, quite long term uh, swap arrangement in place, interest rate swap, um, which obviously has a has a higher interest rate. Um, yeah, a big portion of our of our debt is um, is relatively recent, um, mm -hmm. and already at fairly low rates. Um, and of course, in the thing new coming on board would be coming in at that um, at that very very low low yeah. figure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, just one other thing, the depreciation, um, one of the things that, uh, uh, again, has cropped up is actually um, being able to incorporate your current condition assessments into your assessment of the useful life of an asset. Um, and I think I would want to say that I've generally seen uh, with councils that actually there has been a lengthening out generally in terms of assumptions about the useful life of assets. Has that process in any way um, affected our view about the life of our assets? Dare I say it decreased the cost of depreciation? Um, might, have yeah, so might, have been, might have increased it actually, but I just interested to know. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not sure. Well, it's not for you. I'm just um, I'm just doing a bit of financial management planning here, mate. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, no, look, look, actually, I might um, defer to you on that, um, that Sarah, because I, I, I know that. Um, yeah, 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 you know, in, in our recent um, revaluations, um, yeah, we have had a very strong focus on on, on obviously um, useful life. I mean, it, it needs to be a focus of any any valuation, obviously. Um, but yeah, but some changes have already been been put in place in that regard. Um, so, yeah, Sarah, would you be able to comment yeah. on on that? Yeah, so obviously our condition assessment is incorporated in our valuations for our um, above ground assets, um, which is. Um, yeah, we do uh, quite a good job and we get quite good ratings on um, the information we provide to our valuers. So I'm um, pretty comfortable there. Now, what happened with the last Waters revaluation is that we actually um, did a review 
um, of the youthful lives um, and we, we commissioned um, Opus to do a review of those and we also had a Becker report done. So we did uh, rely on a lot of external um, light, uh, external advice, sorry, and as a result of that, we did adjust um, the lives significantly. Um, now, as a part of this annual um, plan work, Dawn and I also um, engaged, well, Dawn engaged um, Morrison Lowe to have a double check that we were uh, where we should be, and they um, agreed with. Um, where our useful lives are at and didn't think we could make a material um, adjustment there. Um, they did say um, in regards to the LTP, they can have a look at um, our uh, capital works and have a look at whether we needed to fund all of your depreciation. Um, and so we will be commissioning them to do some further work with the LTP. Brilliant. Thank did you. I miss anything, Dawn? No, spot on. Good. No, um, could, oh, Bruce, could I just ask, um, that's pretty interesting work, actually. Um, and I just uh, wondered, is that going to be shared with the committee and, and when the time frame is likely to be? You know, because like, I'm just thinking those are massive asset values. And yeah, with the new environment we'd be working in, you know, there could be heaps of things that will change from business as usual. Uh, yeah, so so look, I can um, comment on that. Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. And in, in terms of the the piece of work that we're looking to do and the lead in to the um to the LTP, um, yes, we we will certainly um keep you um keep you abreast of that. Um, we have already um yeah committed to um to every quarterly um quarterly arc. Um, yeah, um, yeah, Haven and um Haven and Kirsty, um, yeah, bring you an LTP update. Um, so so yeah, look, we'll use that mechanism to um to to report to you on. On, on all of the assumptions underpinning the the LTP and how the LTP is shaping up, etc., and, and including in, in the space that we've just talked about. Please yeah, I think that's yeah. fantastic um, initiative to get that underway. Thanks very much. Clearly, that's that's clearly a a LTP initiative, um, but it's a very valid one mm. because it will shape it will shape up our financial strategy for the coming mm. coming uh, years. Um, mm. And obviously, it is a I think it is within the sector a growing sense that Section 100, the fact that we should have current revenues meeting current expenses is still highly relevant. Mm. Uh, but you also want to take into account the strength of your balance sheet, which is exactly the challenge of the government to us as local government now. Can you use your balance sheet in some way of, of um, uh, uh, relief and or stimulatory effect for recovery? So um, it's a really valid thing to do. So again, well done, well done that we're getting that piece of work done because it makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, look, sorry, I, I just wanted to, I'm conscious we've spent a few bit of time, I just want to wrap up a couple of things here. So I take it, um, Kirsty, one of the things that you said under um, section four, actually I don't have page numbers on mine, you're just other than the paper itself, so don't get too worried, but under item four, you've, you've outlined the next steps that you're taking in terms of the annual plan. I think one of the critical things here is that you're going to do some check of where we're landing with the annual plan relative to year three of the LTP and also the significance policy, presumably just making certain that we can have a straightforward landing in terms of actually adopting in June, correct? Oh, sorry, lost you again, I think, uh, um, Kirsty, sorry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, yes, absolutely correct. Um, that that is um, That will be ongoing, but yes, that is... Mm on the work program. And is there anything, um, this is my final question, sorry that I've, I've dominated questions at the moment because um, I'll do one final sweep around the committee before we move to adopt. Um, is there anything, Gary, that, that um, uh, other than the direct, or right, Kirsty, the direct information about the shovel ready projects that, that, that can be added to this at this stage? I know we're all waiting um, for some time this week, next week for sort of some sort of noises from the smokestack in Wellington. Um, but is there anything here that we need to uh, need to be be aware of from a risk perspective? Um, only speculation by me, Bruce, yes. and, yeah. and that's really. Um, I mean, I've got a I've got a thing in the back of my mind that says if local government across New Zealand is going to be successful in winning money from the crown for shovel-ready projects in the waters infrastructure field, the tag that that money is likely to come with is the formation of asset-owning CCOs. 
Um, exactly. Yeah, look, who got that's hit my intelligence as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that that I think would have a massive impact on on our balance sheet because I think the assumption would be that all of that debt would go with the CCO, well, we and and then we would need to really refocus um, the council onto those uh, the four well beings uh, a lot more than they are now. Mm. In terms of those packages, uh, I, I take it we're making some assumption that if it comes through, we would be co-funding it. So I presume we, um, I think there was, a, we were doing the, the, sorry, the government was doing the round saying, how much are you prepared to put into these projects? So I presume there's a level allowed for within our um, uh, annual plan, if it's relevant, if it can be done within six months, or certainly would I guess more like the LTP, that we are going to co-fund these. Yeah, so, so there are um, parts of the shovel ready projects that are funded within this annual plan and indeed the LTP. And there are others that we would plan to fund in the next LTP. Examples of that are um, the next LTP, the bid for the community infrastructure that we, um, we put into central government was based on the business plans for the next LTP. Mm. Effectively, we were looking to um, check the boxes on all four well-beings. Um, equally, the growth work that we're doing in C1, C2 and C3 is funded in the annual plan. What we've bid for there is um, an interest-free loan for 10 years, mm. given, the, given the risks around the um, growth profile of the district. Yeah. Um, yeah. The water's infrastructure, yes, much of that is funded, but some of it is new. Uh, as I understand it, Dawn, you might want to comment on that. I was thinking about the reservoirs being new or something for the next LTP. Certainly. Uh, um the reservoir new renewals, we, uh, WIPA are just on a whole heap of um, master planning um, and preparation for the next LTP. And so we we were doing business cases outlining what our future infrastructure needs were both in terms of our, our renewals program and preparing for growth. In terms of the ones that we, the $53 million worth of work that we put forward into the um, CIP funding um, application, we, um, we've we actually indicated that, that, that um, we were looking for full funding for those yeah. um so yeah if if it's not funded then yes it'll fall back into the the normal ltp mm. okay that's great um bruce just the the critical point to make here is that um as these projects are by and large capital projects the impact won't be on next year's annual plan but the first year of the ltp so yeah, if we are to win any of that those funds it will be a positive impact on year um one of annexed ltp yes yeah, yeah, and no, I appreciate that. Claire? Yeah, Gary, um, you mentioned that, um, well, first of all, about that operational funding, because I asked you that question this morning as well. Yeah, so, and I know there's going to be more opportunities to um, grab um, central government, you know, funding um, opportunities. And I'm, I'm really hoping that there will be a bigger mix of, of projects where we can get operational funding so it will be able to reduce um, the rates burden. Um, I, I didn't appreciate that, that there was such a large proportion that was simply capital in those initial um, shovel ready projects. Um, and the second point or question I had of you is you mentioned that there might be tags that central government puts on some of these projects which they might fund. So is there going to be a process where council might be able to consider what the implications of those tags are and then whether or not they have the chance to make a counter offer? Or, you know, um, do we just have to light, roll over and just take whatever they give us and, and under whatever conditions that they impose? So as I said, Claire, um, most of this is speculation on my part. So. Um, if the Crown makes an announcement, I'm not sure whether that will come with um, a programme of work which would see new legislation introduced and we would absolutely have the opportunity to make submissions there. But in respect of your comment around um, have we just got to roll over and take what comes? I mean, I guess for a number of years now, the government have been saying, central government um, has been saying to us that as local government you need to find more effective and efficient ways of delivering your waters business. Um, we, we did look at developing uh, 
these sorts of organisations in a shape that we could control. Um, but I, I think that opportunity has now has now passed us, and uh, I think I think the crown, if they're to give money for this sort of um, work program, will have a very clear view about the sort of entity that it requires in order to ensure these investments are made um, in, in a uh, in a prudent fashion. Hmm. Yep, no, absolutely right. I mean, the minister made a slip of the tongue, didn't they, Gary, suggesting there would be five companies, um, which I think that she's had to retract from, but it then came very quickly with the, the, the suggestion that if, we, if there's any money being profited by central government, it would be uh, it would be into a CCO. Are there any other questions um, that council like to, to ask before I perhaps just wrap up and seek to move the motion that we received the report? Yeah, Roger. Just, just one thing of interest was Gary's comment um, uh, earlier on about the level of flexibility that there may be in uh, the annual plan. And I'd really be interested when we get to our later workshops and the submissions and the council meeting, if we could get a little bit more information from Gary as to where that flexibility is and is there an opportunity for us to respond to any negative influences as we go into that year. I think that would be excellent, Gary, if that's possible. Great. Yes, and that makes it that makes the going right back to the original question which you asked him a very good one which was was potential how do you deal with with what effectively uh, is a, a range of possibilities and the outcome of these assumptions um which really is actually how do you retain flexibility to meet either the high low or medium um so that's a that's a fair point right look i think i think that's been a very good discussion thank you for that uh well done number two meeting for you guys this afternoon today um and it strikes me that i'm i we, we've probably discussed uh, five things. One, one is actually uh, people have used the word conservatism. Um, I'd like to perhaps suggest we should re re rephrase that word and say we've tried to build realism into our annual plan. Um, uh, but note, but note, um, on top of that, Gary, we've talked about the capacity for a recovery package, and I think that's if I've got that right, you've talked about the the, the tapping in on some of the value that you've created through arbitrage um, and the likes to deal with that. Um, the shovel ready projects, which probably doesn't affect this annual plan, um, but but in some sense we take as a broader package will will fit in. And we've also talked about rates relief, and Ken, you've talked about how the rates the rates department are very happy and capable and flexible, dare I say it, in dealing with the individualised hardship of um, uh, uh, within the community, which makes a lot of sense. So it does it does suggest to me that with the data, oh, and sorry, and, and sorry, there's another thing, was the data that you've based your realism on, the fact that, that the fact that even between now and June, there is still some more stuff to come. And I think uh, um, uh, you mentioned Steve Tripp from Te Waka and the work you're doing there, which meets uh, a, a sense of wanting to make certain, just, I guess that double check really, in some sense that actually, you know the local view. Um, what I say as councillors, you should also work hard to know the local view as well, but that's me being a wee bit trite. Um, you're doing some decent work to also try and keep the local in your budget, not just the view of infometrics, which I'm not running down, which leaves us then with the area that going into the new year, we need to make certain that that monitoring occurs generally. It's really important for a council law message as a governor. Um, but Ken, I'd just like us to perhaps note that we should think how this committee as a risk committee plays its part. Um, and I would just like to suggest that we think about the financial risks, maybe some stuff I'm looking at elsewhere, which would be useful, which might actually form a, a, a bit of a, um, at least for the coming year, uh, I was about to say a, a sidebar to our general risk reporting, um, which, which we should include as just a specific focus in terms of this. So then that makes me ask one other point. I should have asked this before. Um, with the proposed plan as it stands, we're not in any risk or any trouble with our, our statutory um, 
uh, uh, reg regulations or any covenants we might have with the LGFA, are we? This is all well within the parameters of, of the accepted norms within the sector. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, I, yes I, I wouldn't be expecting um, that we would have any issue with that. I, I mean, the, um, yeah, obviously the great strength we have is, is starting with a very low, um, low debt base. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so yes, we, we, we will have some hits on, on revenue, which would be potentially a covenant issue if our debt was a lot higher. Um, yeah, because of the level our debt is at, I, I don't believe it's going to create any covenant issues. Tasha should be something. I should have that should have been my first question, by the way. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep with that covenant, but let's not let's not get too worried about it. So, so realistic budget. You you you're, you're honing the data, but you're going to be able to do the stuff in June. Um, you've got some capacity around recovery package. You're dealing with the shovel already. You've got some rates relief. We just need to make certain we we um, monitor madly in the new year. Yeah, Gary. Oh, just one more point for the information of the committee, and that is that um, the organisation has just um, completed another review with uh, Fitch from a credit rating perspective. Mm. Um, they did pass some very positive comments at the end of that interview, but that new, that new um, risk rating should be available uh, for the council to consider prior mm. to adopting its annual plan. Right, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the fact that we have, and I'm sure you've discussed it elsewhere, that, um, uh, uh, you know, with LGFA moving out to 300% um, uh, 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 revenue to debt ratio, um, that actually uh, Standard & Poor's, Fitch's, uh, Moody's still retain a relatively, well, a pretty positive view towards the New Zealand um, public sector. Um, but that also includes um, uh, individual councils. So um, hopefully that's reflected in the way Fitch ultimately report on this, Gary. So that's, I, I hope that's really helpful um, to sort of take a high level view of where we're at. I certainly feel comfortable. Um, uh, um, so look, I'd like to um, then move to the recommendation, uh, which is pretty simply that we receive the report. Um, uh, and I mean, that seems like an injustice to some extent to the good work and the good report you provided us, Kirsty. I'm sorry about that. Um, but hopefully the, the, the nature of the conversation is one which shows you we've kicked the tyres on it and, and are pretty comfortable at this point as to where you've got the, the, the whole process to and the risks that are needing to be managed. So I hope that's okay. So look, I'd like to uh, move that um, and we're on back to the recommendation at section two that uh, this paper from Kirsty be received. Could I have a second for that, please? I'll Thank second you. it first. Yes, Susan. Um, I guess technically I should ask, is there any discussion on the, the resolution? But I think there's probably a fair crack. Can I put that, please? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? Thank you. That's great. So thank you for that. That's, um, that's, that's really superb. Um, so we, we have a very similar paper, but actually as equally critical as the first one is knowing that uh, in year three of uh, uh, a long-term plan, we're also having a massively, sorry, of, yes, of a long-term plan, we've got a plan for the next one. Um, and so um, while it might appear similar to the annual plan, as I say, really important. Haven, I think, is it you that's going to lead off this? Or again, Ken, I'm again open to what the betting order is. Uh, uh, yeah, so, 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 so look, um, yeah, very much um, haven to, to lead through this, um, but this is um, obviously being mindful of a longer term focus uh, than, the, um, yeah, than what the annual plan had, but, um, yeah, but obviously engaging in very similar issues and, and very similar assumptions. So, yeah, so, so, so Haven and, and Kirsty, um, yeah, very happy for you to lead through this item. Thank you, Chairman and Ken. So yeah, as this committee will recall from its last meeting, um, staff are underway with preparing the groundwork for the next LTP. And um, we just wanted to inform you, or give you an update on that project and how it's been impacted by the, by the pandemic and some of the decisions that have come from that. Um, so it's all in the report. So I'll just provide a quick summary of the report and then perhaps open up for any questions and comments, discussion. Um, so in terms of the LTP, I get the main impact, yes, is uh, essentially those changes or potential 
significant changes to the significant forecasting assumptions that underpin the LTP and how those might then flow on and um, impact our general approach to preparing the LTP, which has been to carry on with our current one as far as practical with that extensive capital works program. Um, there are other impacts um, that the pandemic has caused, including disruptions to the work environment, public spaces, and some of the capacity from key staff. However, as we're adjusting to working under these different alert levels, um, we, we're, we're comfortable that, that, that those issues aren't um, getting too out of hand and we can, the, the main impacts are from the uh, significant forecasting assumptions. So given that, the project governance group has endorsed a recommendation to be a bit more flexible as we prepare our LTP, um, especially regarding for the timeframes for some of the deliverables within, within the LTP um, project plan. Um, that kind of that gives two main benefits for the council. Firstly, it gives us a lot more time to understand the impacts from the pandemic on those significant forecasting assumptions. And it also has allowed staff to focus on other priority work, namely this um, current annual plan. Um, so where to next um, in terms of the LTP project? Uh, once the annual plan is completed, we will home back into the LTP and we'll come back to uh, elected members and check in on that overall approach to preparing the LTP. And um, that discussion will be informed by the monitoring of those changes to the significant forecasting assumptions, the work from Infometrics and some of the other data that people have touched on today, namely the, the Solgam, Solgam data pack that we have access to, potentially some of the Tawaka to work at environmental, uh, sorry, economic data that we, uh, survey data that we're gonna look at. And um, yeah, then have that discussion on our approach to the LTP. And then that will flow into re-looking at the external priorities and then deciding what projects go into the LTP and what at what years. Um, so yeah, we've still got those two risks, um, two very high risks in the LTP. Um, regarding key staff's availability and then delivery, delivery of the capital of the works in the LTP. Um, but yeah, as the, as the paper notes, um, we, we intend to move back to BAU and have, have staff focusing back on the LTP. And also from the work with the annual plan, we'll have uh, more information about, about delivering that capital works program. So yeah, I guess that's a quick overview of the paper. So happy to open up for any commentary or discussion. Thank you, appreciate that, Roger. Yeah, um, I, the, the grid of all the risks, it's, I'm sure it must be very interesting, but unfortunately on my size of screen, it's impossible to read. <laughs> and I'm sure in, in life, it's probably an A3 or something like that. Yeah. Can you get us a hard copy out of that so that we can have a, a good perusal of that risk analysis? Yep, yep, absolutely. I think that's just something to do with it coming from being copied over from the previous report this committee received, but I'm sure we can um, recirculate that in a format that you can digest a bit easier. That's Lovely. A good point. Thank you. Good, good point, Roger. Unfortunately, for Haven, I have been able to read mine, so I've got questions for him. So I'll just warning him, but it's not the end of the mm -hmm. <laughs> councillors. Have got any other questions that you'd like to ask Haven for? A, again, a very good set of papers. We're essentially noting that there are, there are two papers here in effect that we're, we're covering across. So, um, um, Bruce, could I ask a few questions of Haven? Go for uh, it, please. Yeah, um, I'm thinking about the population or the demographic. Um, data sources that you're relying on. I, I still see it's NIDIA and the um, old census. And um, I think we are gonna see a change, I think in, in our growth rates or internal migration, whatever. Um, it'd be really good. Like what I've always worried about with NIDIA is it doesn't take into account internal migration. Um, and is there a plan to collect data from another area where you might get a more accurate measure of that? So the council's already agreed to use that current population, um, those current population projections. But I guess when we reassess our approach, we will ask that question and figure out if we're gonna stick to those 
um, population projections that NIDIA has produced, or if we'll look for a bit of an alternative to tweak those figures. I think the stuff that I've been reading is the, the, the longer term trends are still accurate, but yeah, as people probably understand, the, the next three or four years might be changing. But yeah, I, I guess we will have to make a decision on whether we're, when, when we check in on our overall approach, are we still going to use those um, that NIDIA data as our population projections? Yeah, I think okay. the other and interesting I'll... thing there further to that is that the 2018 geographic data on the census is now available. So we can get uh, some better definition of what current population levels are between the two key centers. Um, and I certainly accessed that and I found it very interesting. Sorry to, um, Claire, to have interrupted you. Oh, that's right. I was, I was just going to ask some more questions about the risk register, mainly under forecasting assumptions. Uh, there's the significant changes occur within the external economic environment and puts pressure on the LTP process. And that's just down as a high risk, uh, which I thought might have been escalated to be very high. I don't know. And, and underneath that cell or line is also about um, policy direction changes like the zero carbon bill and things like that. And like climate change has really um, not featured very strongly in, in mainstream um, media about COVID-19 responses. But there are groups that are saying, if we're going to make changes, we should be making them that are environmentally responsible and climate responsible. And so I, I'm just... I'd just like to highlight that. I'm not saying that the the, um, the risk rating that you've got there um, isn't appropriate anymore, but, but I think there's an opportunity um, that's, that's being articulated in our community and I wouldn't like that opportunity to be lost. What was the first one that you mentioned, sorry, Claire? It was, um, it was under forecasting assumptions, the third, third line down, significant changes occur within the external economic environment, puts pressure on the LTP process. And it's just as a, it's a, as a high risk. And I would have thought it should be higher than that. Escalated up, right. Um, yes, so we, will, we can take that recommendation to the next um, project governance group meeting and discuss and see whether it gets escalated. Thanks. Any other questions, guys? All right, Haven. I said I had a few, so let's see what we um, let's see what we what I can come with. Just I wanted to go right back to your first paper and just check what you meant, what what flexibility meant that the project steering group had given flexibility. Um, I know what flexibility means in terms of deadlines, but how does this affect us against the reasonably fixed date of of an LTP? So we're being pretty ambitious in our, in our project management plan. And I think under the current, well, under the original plan, we would have been having discussions on setting the strategic, the external strategic priorities either now or very soon, and then rolling into having discussions on which year projects go in. So we're, I guess we're looking to defer that until we get this annual plan out of the way. So that's the, the main area where we're seeking flexibility. And then I guess the other thing is that, um, we, we've got the re we're looking in on the vision for the district and um, the community outcomes. And that process has been imp impacted in terms of um, speaking to our public and public spaces. So we've got some information and we just need to confirm if we're gonna, we're gonna proceed with further information in that space or not. Um, and that is, is another discussion that we need to have as well. Does that, does that vision work relate to the pre-consultation with the community on vision, community outcomes and priorities? Yes, that's right, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that's been held back and you'll make a call on whether to continue with that at a later stage. So, so we, we need to consult work. We've done the, the sort of wider community, uh, like the neighborhood barbecue phases of it. And then it was gonna roll into some targeted stakeholder engagement, like EWI groups and business sectors. Yeah. And we just need to determine the right way to approach that part of it. Great, I'll put my hand up for the barbecues. That'd be great. Right, it's a joke. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, uh, I was interested. It's often a hard one to deal with. Um, so I've moved to the second paper. I think it is now section three. 
Uh, it's often a hard one to actually, um, uh, I find as a governor, if I can call myself that, is to deal with, which is actually levels of service. Um, and I'm interested that actually at this point, um, you're reflecting that they're essentially the, the, the 10 year views on levels of service going forward will be pretty much what you do now. In fact, if I've read this correctly, there's not a lot of capacity to embark on new projects in the plan, which I take it means in some way modifying, changing, increasing or entering new areas of levels of service. Have I got that right or am I misreading that, uh, Haven? So this is in the... The, the, the second paper, You, I think it's the second paper, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'd give, love to give you the page number, but I, I seem to have got a series of my uh, PDF just doesn't have the, the overall page numbers on the agenda. You go to um, key actions to date on the second paper. Yes, it yeah. is the second paper. You'll see under that levels of service. Yeah, yeah. The page so we, three of that second paper. So yeah, um, we've already we have confirmed with council when we're preparing this LTP to maintain the levels of service from the 2018 um, long term plan. And I guess, again, when we have that, when we check in on the conversation around whether we're going to maintain our approach, then we'll, if, if it is, yes, we're going to recommit to our approach, then we will perhaps not have to have another discussion on levels of service. But if we do look to make changes, then we will, we might have to have another discussion and relook at the levels of services and if there's any changes to those as well. But at this stage, we're, we're, we're working towards maintaining the current levels of service for all of our activities. Mm. So one of the one of the I mean that's an important assumption along with actually Claire's perspective around population becomes really important. They all and actually your asset information they all feed into your activity management plan. So when 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 would you hope to have the activity management plans actually signed off? So the activity management plans have been reviewed over the last twelve months. Um, I believe that there's dawn if you uh, confirm if i have something wrong here but i believe um we're at a stage where the where we're comfortable with the activity management plans i do not believe that they get officially signed off do they or um, to that haven through the chair um so the we've had the response and feedback from the independent external review um, there is a, a program um, for addressing those in terms of an action plan um, and the intention is that they will be finalised as at the end of September. So that has been pushed out somewhat. Um, through the chair, the second report that you refer to um, from Haven, I think is the report that was presented to the 9th of March meeting. Um, so that was, if you like, our quarterly update on the LTP. Oh, um, sorry. So yeah, okay. This report that Haven's presenting today is, is just an update um, responding to, I guess, in the immediate aftermath of COVID-19, but the intention is that we will be reporting a, a further quarterly report um, in June. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, oh, look, you, you, you know, look, I don't know why I didn't pick that one up myself. You're right, it's the 9th of March, so sorry about that, Haven. Um, though I am, and although, can I honestly, I think my questions are still quite valid. <laughs> um, but I look, I, I take the point on board um, that you give me the answer that I'm looking for, Kirsty, that your asset management, sorry, your activity management plans are done by September. Um, my experience uh, is that councils don't firm those up early enough, um, thinking that actually giving the activity management plan is essentially the LTP, when in fact you then have to put it all together and try and work out as a total package how it actually fits together. So I'm comforted by the fact that you're, you're, you're targeting September, even if it is delayed and impacted on by COVID and the need to have focus so much on the, the annual plan, that's great. For this year, um, we had actually intended that they would be completed well in advance of now. However, the feedback yeah. from, um, from that independent review, we satisfied that the front end um, is sufficiently detailed to inform the business cases that have been developed to then progress through the LTP process. So that just gives, is a great segue then for me into the, into the risk table. Oh, sorry, Gary, go for it. Um, look, the, I think the big risk with um, 
the population projections, which Claire raised earlier, was is, is around the recovery, um, because we're going to have to gear the organisation at, at a level. And when the recovery comes, the indications are that it's going to be a very rapid upswing. And then um, in terms of the migration conundrum, we've knocked 20% off our growth because 20% of our growth was uh, externally led. So um, once you get a vaccine and the borders open, then you get straight away, you get another 20% growth. One thing that um, uh, Infometrics have said is that um, in terms of internal migration, WIPA is really well placed because it's a very attractive place to develop. Mm -hmm. And that as people look to depart the cities in the wake of COVID, um, it's, it's likely that if, if, anyone, if anywhere's got a strong growth agenda in the North Island, it's, it's going to be WIPA. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd just like to say, Gary, that that was one of the reasons for my question, because I, I heard about that too from your advisors, and I, I do think it's on the cards. I just think we've got to have our finger on the pulse to see when we can see that, you know, so we've got an early indication of that wave coming. Right, can we have Roger then, uh, Andrew, please? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm a little concerned that some of our strategic documents that we have currently in place in which supposedly are uh, establishing a foundation for the LTP going forward are actually based on quite outdated figures, particularly the transportation study. Um, some of those stats there project a population in 2050, which particularly for Cambridge has already been surpassed in 2018. So that's an indication that, you know, perhaps those strategic documents need to be reviewed prior to us looking at the activity plans for the LTP going forward. Now, I know that that's a big ask, but there seems to be little point in having a strategic document that is not uh, reflecting uh, current projections and current needs and population trends. Yeah. If I can respond to that, um, so with through the elected member induction, we identified um, and, and um, detailed for you the strategy work program, which includes a review of the, the strategies that we have in place. So there are a number that were developed in 2009, 2010 that haven't been subsequently reviewed. Um, so we do have a program in place to review those. Um, in fact, we've commenced the review of the environment strategy um, we, we have on our radar um, to the commencement of the economic development strategy has also begun. Um, and we have a radar to review the transport um, strategy that you refer to, um, Councillor Gordon, um, and also looking at developing a community strategy. With regard to the activity management plans, they are, they are far um, progressed. There are a number of other strategies in place, such as our district growth strategy that informs um, our, our business cases um, and, and the activity management plans um, leading into the development of the, the long-term plan. So the intention was with the direction provided by the previous council and this current council that we would maintain um, the current approach of the 2018-28 LTP, that we would commence the work um, revisiting with the community the vision and the community outcomes. Once that we had that feedback, that would help to then inform the redevelopment of our strategies, which would then ensure those strategies would drive the development of the next LTP, being the 2024-34 LTP, with very much a focus on building those livable communities. Um, so yes, um, there, are, there are some issues and some difficulties around timing. Unfortunately, it's not an ideal world that we live in and we, you know, we haven't um, well progressed that redevelopment of those strategies um, as much as we would have liked to um, ahead of the development of the 2021-31 LTP and now we're responding to COVID-19. Um, but I guess it's, it's highlighted the need for us to be adaptive and flexible and, um, and partnering with joining um, local authorities and other agencies to ensure that we've, we've 
consistent um, in relying on um, the same strategic information. Sorry, can I just clarification there? Did you say that we wouldn't have a, an effective review of the transportation strategy in time for this current NTP, that it would be in place for the subsequent LTP? Um, so through the chair, what I said was that we have developed a program of work for the redevelopment of the strategies, and that includes revisiting the transportation strategy. So that review work um, is, has, has started, um, but it is intended that it will progress over the next financial year. So that will lead into the, L, the next LTP. However, in terms of completion of, um, of comprehensive new strategies, they are unlikely to be completed um, as at the 1st of July 2021. However, that work will be underway and, and progressing. Yeah. I've just got to say it's a bit of a concern for me that because it's got major implications for Cambridge in what we're seeing. And I think the, uh, the growth that you mentioned, 3.5% over the last year, um, that's had quite considerable impact here on transport and transport issues. And Just if I can to, clarify, the activity yeah. management plans, they all do use the same population progressions. So the transport one will be consistent with all the other activity management plans, population um, projections. In terms of the strategy, though, I, I can't comment on that one. So through the chair, also, in terms of preparing those activity management plans, they're not constrained to just the, um, for example, in the transportation space, just that integrated strategic, uh, transport strategy. They also um, look at what is happening at a national level, what is happening sub-regionally, what is happening um, at a regional level, and, and um, looking at the documentation that is in place. Um, also looking at initiatives that are currently underway. So it's not just reliant on a strategy that was developed some years ago. Mm. I continue to register my concern on that. Thank you. It's always a rabbit race to try and line everything up, uh, Roger, but uh, your point's well made. Andrew, I think you're next. All right. <coughs> Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I, look, I um, just a we came on on that last piece, um, Roger. You know, you're right to be concerned. We all are, but um, we also have to be practical. And as Kirsty said, um, definitely have to be adaptive um, when we're looking at this next LBP LTP. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on on growth, in particular as it re relates to construction. Um, I, I think the experience after the GFC was that construction continued to be uh, uh, outwardly healthy for six months or so while um, the, the, the projects in hand were completed. It wasn't until that period. Of, so, so we are going to have, I, I would suggest, you know, quite solid growth in the next six months in terms of households um, in particular. Um, it's really consents that we need to be looking at as soon as as soon as we're getting data coming through to see what what's going to happen for the the first quarter first half of next year in in terms of you know where our construction construction industry is going to be going to be going so just through the chair um so wayne allen's group is um monitoring those consent applications coming into the organization resource consents and building consents um, they, they are reported to the council through the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee on a quarterly basis through that district growth report. Um, my understanding is that those are also, um, so that we are looking at what information can be sourced to be able to um, share at an organisation level and also with elected members and direct response to COVID-19. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for Right, is there any other questions from folk? Uh, as always, I'm going to have my little questions now, but I just wonder if anything else people want to raise before I do. Okay, and thank you, Kirsty, for actually pointing out to me properly about the paper. So let me just try and keep on track here. So just going back to your, your, your lead paper, Haven, just a couple of things. One, and I'm trying to relate that to the, to the commentary you provided on, on where the 
travel of the risks are in terms of it. You've noticed the key personnel risk is somewhat mitigated by the, the, um, the flexible approach, which we've discussed at some length in terms of um, uh, the governance group, which, which makes some sense. So if I go to item, if I go to section four, um, uh, the other ones that you've got there are overestimation of the level work that can be achieved. That's actually probably a classic thing. We all we all overestimate what we get done in, this, in a set amount of time. Um, and, and in effect, the fact that you've got a, pro, you've got a project going is, is reasonably good and that's fine, but it's obviously one that you are, are going to need to watch just as obviously that the other ones about key star. Can I just raise one question then, which is related to the to the um, the risk tables and the old paper, is is even though two of them become, I think, high, you still have a residual risk of very high in that grouping called business cases. And this is something that we've had a discussion on before, I think probably, but hello, not surprisingly at the March meeting. How's, how's that topic of business cases moved on? So the business cases... Um... As a, uh, sorry, I haven't jumped with you. I mean, as a risk, I mean, it's been highlighted on the, on the, on the risk schedule as a risk. Yep. And, and I'm, I'm rolling there that there are three risks associated with business cases. So I guess I'm asking it at that high level, how have we gone on the business cases? Because it's really important for what gets bid for and gets put into uh, put, put into the LTP. So yeah, they're currently a high risk business cases um, in terms of the timing. And I guess we're going to look at the business cases when we prioritize the projects after the external strategic priorities are set. Um, and I believe we still have enough time in the in the scheme of things to get everything pulled together into a draft annual plan in sort of September, October. And the business cases are well progressed at the moment to inform that draft, pulling together that draft annual plan. Um, so I don't think that the, the risk rating or level is, um, a concern in terms of getting higher and we we're, we're working with all the people that are pulling finalizing their business cases at the moment and then um, we're, we're putting the ones that have been finalized into the financial systems and um, yeah there's been the good good progress made with those business cases we do have just have a few to follow up in some of the different activity areas that have had to turn their attention back to responding to the pandemic but I think we're 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 good in terms of meeting the time frame of pulling together the draft annual plan. Brilliant. Thank you for that. That's important. Yeah, if I can just add to that, that we do have a cross organizational workshop of managers to, um, to do a first review of the um, draft business cases, not to look at, um, I guess, the, the content in detail, but rather to look at um, what was happening across the, the whole of the business, what were the key issues, linkages, alignment, um, timing and funding issues. In addition, there has also been a review um, of those business cases with a growth impact. So Richard Bax, our consultant development engineer, has also undertaken a comprehensive review of those business cases um, with a growth component. Um, and, and in addition, um, there has been um, review work undertaken by finance staff. So it is intended that there will be further review work undertaken, but it has been stepped um, to this point. Thanks for that, um, Kirsty. Are there any other questions or comments people would like to make? Right, thank you. Can I move then to the recommendation? Again, it's a bit like the previous one. It seems a very underwhelming resolution for, for what has been a very fulsome report. Um, Haven, thank you very much, and Kirsty, um, but is, is giving us a sense of um, how you've had to flex and stress, but, but deal with the stresses of doing an LTP while we're still clearly totally tied down by an annual plan. Would somebody like to move this motion, please, that the, the report be received? Thank you, Andrew. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Jim. I think you didn't have you, you got your mute on, but I took the hand yeah. as a signal that you're going to do it, buddy. That's great. Yeah, um, I can raise I can raise my hand quicker than I can find the mute button. <laughs> Go on the business is what you're saying, Bruce. Can I, I don't think we need to, to see if there's any discussion on the motion. Uh, can I ask, please, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? 
Kerry, thank you very much. That's great. So now we're into our next item. Um, and it's, uh, I think I suspect Sarah and then Leon. So this is the audit proposal. You recall that last meeting, the 9th of March, um, we had a range of uh, uh, documents from uh, Leon, which essentially set up the audit amongst other things. But in essence, we were signing a contract without knowing what the cost was. Um, that's a bit crude, but still not inaccurate. And uh, uh, Leon, um, with the support of the Auditor General, has been able to come back to us with a with a fee. So, Sarah, um, you probably need to lead off the batting, but Leon, obviously, uh, welcome your comments on your letter. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, obviously, uh, the report is uh, around presenting the letter given from the Auditor General responding to COVID-19 and the audit fees, and then the draft audit proposal letter. And um, so, the Auditor General letter um, outlined the review work that was being done on uh, local government uh, auditing, and that was around um, the perceived increased requirements on auditors, um, changes in growth within organisations, changes what need to be um, audited as well as the competitive market for audit staff. So that was leading a you know, perceived under recovery of audit fees. Um, however, due to uh, the impacts of COVID-19, the Auditor General has decided to hold our fees at a 1.5% increase. So they've also advised that any, any costs for additional work um, that may need to be done uh, due to the impacts of COVID-19 will need to be recovered by the auditors, which will be in addition to the 1.5% um, and will be discussed with us in due course. Um, so then um, after that uh, letter was received from the Auditor General, uh, we received the letter from Leon um, from Audit New Zealand outlining um, the audit proposal letter. Um, this, this gave... Um, the fee for the year ended 31st of June 2020, um, which was in line with the Auditor General letter um, of 1.5% increase. So, um, uh, but then did, didn't outline the years 2021 and 2022 and um, uh, that was that was outlined in the letter as well. So um, we were happy with the budgeted audit hours. They're expected to increase from 8.15 to 9.57. Um, and um, yeah, so I don't know if Leon has anything to add to, add to that. Yeah, Smiling, so you must have something to add, so go for it, Leon. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Your Worship, and all councillors. Um, uh, oh, and, and sorry, and management and staff. Uh, so, Kat and I really appreciate that we could attend this meeting. There were some really excellent discussions and very good work by management. I, uh, yeah, I, I must commend you on that. Um, some of the things that, uh, as your external auditor, liked to hear was, of course, the conservative and prudent approach. That's music to an external auditor's ears the realistic budget setting, revaluations, re and especially the improvement of asset data. Um, we recognize the, the stress levels of all of you, councillors, management staff, to deliver essential services to residents. And I'm therefore really glad that John decided to cap the fees for this year. And we don't have to add another level of stress of, uh, of discussing, discussing incre uh, an increase in fees. So that discussion will have next year, hopefully, when things are a bit more normal. Um, Sarah touched on some of the areas that, uh, that are the reasons for the increase in fees across uh, all local authorities. Um, and for me, the ones that, that, uh, that, I, that I've seen over the last few years are, for instance, the changes in auditing standards. Um, which include the Auditor General's expectation that we provide a quality audit. Uh, so the, the amount of work that we need to do around revaluation rates, grant revenue uh, has just, uh, well, it increased quite a lot. Um, I, I think it more than doubled in those specific areas. Then one other thing uh, is, of course, the wiper specific uh, area, and that is growth. Although that makes it uh, the audit interesting, it does add quite a bit of risk to us. And then lastly, one of the other ones that Sarah also touched on was audit staff and the availability of audit staff. I mentioned to Bruce yesterday, 
day before, that uh, my own daughter uh, refused to work for us because she says uh, she gets paid just enough or the same as my audit staff uh, with much less risk. So we have less and less people coming into the auditing profession, making it a bit, bit tougher to have staff available. Um, I'm happy to take questions now, but I want to touch on the impact on this year's audit just at some stage, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, well, let's treat it as, as a separate item. So we, let's let's talk about the the, audit, the the current year's audit separately. Let's just try and deal with the fee issue right at the moment. Um, uh, uh, this is good territory to get into. Most councils do. Um, does anybody want to, or will I do it? <laughs> Go for it, Claire. Thank, thanks, Bruce, and hello, Leon. It's good to see you and Kat as well. Um, well. There were two big questions from the audit arrangements letter. Uh, one was that there's a big increase in the hours of non-CA qualified staff. And I just wanted to get an understanding of um, like, is that still gonna maintain the quality that you're gonna be uh, needing um, to get the audit done? And the second was around this question of extra hours that are going to arise because of the COVID-19 situation? Like what kind of, do you know what kind of things might we um, be needing extra audit um, oversight, you know, in, in that arena? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. So, uh, yeah, I'm still comfortable that we'll be able to complete a, 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 quite a good quality or an excellent quality audit, um, even though we changed the, the staff mix, um, mm -hmm. we just realised that we, you know, there are some areas that we can use more junior staff, and they're obviously a bit more cheaper than, than <laughs> more senior staff. Um, and uh, so for me, it was, you know, I'm still new to WIPA, uh, but working through that last year, that's where, where I got to. As far as the impact of COVID-19 is concerned on the audit, uh, we've been auditing from our little bubbles um, uh, for, well, ever since we went into uh, lockdown. Um, the Hamilton and Tauranga offices actually went in one week earlier because some of our staff were exposed to someone who may have been possibly exposed to uh, <laughs> someone who may have been, yeah. So <laughs> we take it rather seriously and we are very careful. And so we went into lockdown earlier and we had to work through areas that we can actually audit. At the moment, things are actually going rather well. Mm -hmm. And I'm... As long as we all, I think for me, the main thing is this is something I wanted to bring up a bit later, but for me, the main thing this year will be communication between your staff and management and our staff and, and myself and Kat. Um, and I, I'm not aware of anything at the moment that causes me concern to say, I think there's gonna be an increase. Oh, but, but the sound, by the sound of it, is that communication that's gonna be absolutely critical between you your team and, and staff to, yeah. Absolutely. And and that's mm -hmm. not a concern. That's just a comment because we mm -hmm. do have a really good relationship. We're open and honest with each other. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that'll just need to continue more than have to start. Mm. Okay. Thanks very much. Actually, I think, um, uh, sorry, through, through you as Chair Bruce, I, I think communication is always essential in, in any audit, um, Leon. So, yeah, so, 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 so I realise this one may have a few more challenges, but um, yeah, but, but certainly communication is, um, is, is crucial to, the, to, to a very effective audit exercise. Yes, I was relating the story yesterday to uh, to Leon, which which admittedly comes from the internal audit side, not the external audit side, but um, Lee and I were talking about an old colleague, Mark Maloney at uh, Auckland Council, mm -hmm. who's the chief internal auditor. And they have been able to carry out a full internal audit program working remotely. So um, new, new normal has, um, has forced real changes onto the way in which auditors are able to work generally. So it'll be interesting to see, Leon, Leon how that goes. Are there other questions or will I again get back to my, my list of questions that Leon knows that's probably gonna come? <laughs> Leon, look, I, I thank you for the absolute honesty of this letter. You realise, by the way, if I can just talk to you directly, I might not have read fully this letter when we spoke yesterday, so it actually answers a good number of my questions. But I would like to reflect. Um, uh, um, one thing I said to Leon is I'm less inclined as a chair of the Audit Risk Committee to have too much of a time on audit fees as long as 
I get a sense that we are we are getting no quality order and getting good service. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't negotiate fees, um, uh, and, um, but it does mean that I think um, this, we should have less stress over fees if there is good order, if there is good service going. It does suggest, by the way, Leon, that, that there is quite a mountain here when it looks like the fees that we'll want extra in the next year is in the order of around about $30,000. Um, and I'm not, you know, that's for negotiation later stage. Um, but I do appreciate that, that, that this letter is a good starting point in terms of transparency about where, um, uh, to, and let's depersonalise that the Auditor General has said that he believes there has been systemic under recovery of audit fees across the public sector. So I'm not defending it, but I'm just saying thank you for being upfront that that is, that is it. And if, if you need to understand what I'm saying there to my colleagues, Look at the second paragraph under the under the um, the fee, which says the estimated cost would be actually one hundred and eighty-two thousand uh, um, dollars. I think that's includes the GST, which is about thirty-two thousand dollars higher than our fee last year. So it's a strong indication that actually, um, when the Auditor General says in his view there is under recovery, that is actually at a reasonable hit. So the one point five percent. Um, seems like a, a gift horse right at the moment, but it doesn't put off the fact that reasonably soon we'll have to have a serious discussion around the the, the fee for next year. Um, Leon, just just I, I think it's helpful. Um, uh, one of the other things I've tried to Leon and I have talked about, and Ken, you have sort of seen semi emails from me, is about how do we front load the issues to make the audit reasonably reasonably. Um, uh, uh, capable of being done in the time and in the stress. Um, and actually, I appreciate your points here about why the, the fee, uh, sorry, the hours are going up, and obviously the fee's going up as a result. I just thought if I could ask you um, um, three questions in relationship to, I mean, it's partly extra hours, but it's actually also just understanding what you're doing. So yesterday you described to me the, 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 the the nature of the work you have to do for an asset revaluation, which can I say um, has changed substantially since I was an auditor. So um, can you just give us a sense, Lee, on for the rest of the the, the, the um, committee, revaluations, I think, was the first item in your arrangement that are saying this is a key audit matter for us. But can you tell us what you actually have to do these days? Rough, you know, thumbnail sketch. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's it's something we, we don't always put in words, and but it's interesting. About ten years ago, when I was still uh, auditing the Wadarapa councils, we'll uh, get a revaluation from a valuer, say thank you, put it on file, and that's it. Uh, these days, you have to interrogate all these assumptions, look at his uh, expertise and uh, technical expertise, um, look at the how assets are made up, the components. Uh, look at the component prices, uh, look at the indices, and see if these uh, his assumptions are actually reasonable. So the amount of work, as, as I said earlier, um, really increased a lot by probably, well, it at least doubled, if not more. And uh, I don't think we ever kept up with it. So this, the, the, well, that's the example around revaluations. Yeah, yeah. So in effect, the nature of the work you're doing and relying on other experts is one where you actually have been asked by auditing standards to um, dig and kick the tyres a lot more. I'm mixing my metaphors there. You've got to kick the tyres a lot more of rather than you have in the past. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's in all areas the same. I mean, in, in, in the distant past, we, we didn't even look at rates properly because it's a legislative requirement and we relied on, on, on legislation. We're doing much more on, 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 on rates as well. And uh, because of the you know, court cases they were and so forth. Um, Non-financial performance reporting, same thing. They are just some extra, extra complexities. Uh, one of the silly things for me was the, was the DIA measures and the colors. Um, so I've got an audit manager who's actually color blind, so he can't audit that because uh, he, will, he wouldn't know whether the colors are right, and they have to be 100% right. That's right, yes, yes. Are you able to give me an indication what balances or what particular aspects of the impact of growth add to your time on the job? 
what do you what which balance is it development contributions is it what what is it that's actually affect what actual work do you have to eyeball in yep. terms of dealing with our complexity of growth which is a lovely challenge for us but obviously a lovely challenge for you too <laughs> yes, it is indeed. Oh, definitely development contributions so on the revenue and uh, revenue side, uh, but also non-financial performance uh, reporting. So, you know, which, uh, which of those measures are impacted? And the one risk of, of growth is that you actually may not meet your levels of service, which becomes a, becomes a, a bit of a critical issue. And then, of course, normal expenditure but also the capital expenditure to be able to, to, to cater for, for the growth. And, and I think, you know, capital expenditure is actually not that difficult, but then what are the future uh, operating expenditure required for the new uh, extra capital expenditure? And that's where we, we spend quite a bit of extra time on. Right, no, thank you for that. That's that's um, uh, uh, really helpful. So look, it may be that, that, that actually I should let you just talk about a bit about the coming audit and the impact um, because as I said I'm very to know whether you can front load any issues but if I leave you with my last question or it might be that in fact Sarah has to answer it but item section seven has the assumptions relating to the audit fee which just you know which is where potentially uh, um, we can fall uh, I'm going to say foul it's a bit drastic of of the assumption and there can be a request for for extra uh, extra fees, which is still capable under the under the John Ryan solution, um, and I just like to have a, a check probably with you, Sarah. Do those assumptions um, are they ones that we can hold to reasonably comfortably? Um, yeah, look, I think so. After the recommendation of last year's audit, um, we have actually set up a um, annual report project group, and we are running it in a little bit more of a project managed um, way. Now, I am aware that last year. Obviously, we had a few issues because of the cloud transition right at the end of the financial year. And unfortunately, there were just things we couldn't produce at all. And then some we couldn't produce within the timeframes um, required. So um, it was a bit push last year. I don't expect any issues this year um, from, from that perspective. And like I said, uh, with the recommendation of audit, we have implemented that um, annual report project group. And I think that'll actually have a um, positive difference. Brilliant. No, thank you for that, Sarah, and thank you for um, WIPA picking up its its obligations as well, which is really good. And, and if it's feeding into the into the communication um, dynamic that you raised, uh, Leon, that's even better. So thank you, Sarah, for that comfort. That's great. Um, so look, I think probably leaves it then to you to, to wrap up your final comments, Leon. Um, perhaps with my little request to think about actually how do we front load issues? How do we take the the, the issues? That could trip us up, and have in the past, like revaluations, out of the out of the end of year battle, if I can call it that, and 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 have ourselves more clear on those bigger issues, so that it's it is really a genuine case of you wrapping up your and doing your testing that you need to do without with minimum risk that we we have issues that trip us up at year end. Yep, thank you. Um, so as far as the revaluations are concerned, that's one thing we're definitely bringing forward. So uh, we're coming in in June, or well. If I say come in, we might come in through the internet and not drive up. But uh, so we plan to look at revaluations in June. Um, I think it's early June. Uh, and that has been agreed between Sarah and Kat, I'm sure. Well, I hope I'm not lying. Um, but uh, that, was the, that was the plan. So, and that is the biggest thing for us to bring forward. If we can get that piece of work out of the way and we're all comfortable with that, uh, that's a huge part of the of the final audit, and that can go wrong um, at year end. So yeah, that's, just, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, through the chair, yeah, we have actually received draft uh, fair value assessments for um, infrastructural assets um, within the last couple of days, and they're all looking good. And yeah, so again, don't perceive any issues from there, and it doesn't look like we'll be tr triggering a revaluation either because they have one numbers in front of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's really positive. So infrastructure assets were last review last year. So and they be done every two years. So this year is just a fair value assessment. And if it doesn't trigger a valuation, that's great news. So we'll work through those and confirm that. And then the other one is land and buildings. But I think that's actually due this year for a reval. 
wasn't it done in yes. Sanofi? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. And that's the other one we'll try and do early this year. Sweet. What I mentioned about COVID-19 is, of course, this is, you know, we will need to be agile, but th there are some, some positives out of this. So we also charge you for disbursement, travel of our staff mostly because we don't have too many stay over. Um, and then, of course, uh, we budgeted $2,000. Last year, it was over 3000 So we charged them on a uh, reasonable and actual basis. Now, this year, we haven't been on site. Um, uh, lately and we we're not even sure we're going to be on site in june so the at least some good news out of this is that the disbursements may be a bit lower and we're also looking as an organization do we actually need our staff to sit at, at the client site a whole week or do they need to be there two three days a week that that reduces stress on all, both levels and also focus our staff on you need to get this done so that you can go to the client on Thursday and ask your specific questions. Well, if you can't send it via email. So th those are things that, you know, uh, impacting us and how we're going to try and work a bit differently as well. And hopefully a bit even more efficiently because that is, that's, that's going to be critical in future as well. Uh, one bit of, information that I think John, the Auditor General, has put out there is about priority audits. Um, I don't see this impacting at the moment, but I have to raise the risk that there is, there is a, a remote risk that, you know, if something, if we don't have staff, if we can't get supplementary staff from, from other service providers, or he can't get enough staff to do certain work, he'll have to focus on the 52 billion being spent because that's what uh, taxpayers are going to ask about. He has to focus on, on the controller function that the money is actually spent correctly as per the, the, the budgets for the government. Uh, he may have to focus on big audits like IRD, MSD, and he may decide that uh, smaller audits will have to be pushed out. So this is just uh, me raising a risk in an open, transparent way. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Mm. Is there a chance that non-Wellington staff will get pulled into that? Yes, most definitely. We are looking at a more uh, national resourcing framework um, because there are just not enough staff in, in Wellington. Um, interesting, more people want to live and work in Tauranga than in, than in Wellington. So we're already uh, resourcing staff from our Tauranga offices to help out there as well as as far as ourselves as uh, Dunedin, because we've got some issues there. But that is normal kind of national resourcing. I'm not, that doesn't concern me. The concern will be if he decides certain audits will need to be pushed out. Because the problem is, when are we going to do them? I want this annual audit done and dusted before we start with the, with the LTP. You need a good base. So anyway, but yeah, a remote risk, but I just wanted to embrace it. Thank you, Leon. You've mentioned priority, and I'm sure that you will argue strongly that YPAR is your best priority. So, um, um, absolutely. You're all lady of chocolate biscuits. Good morning to you, if that's the case. Okay. Are there any other questions for Leon? I think we've had a pretty good go. Thank you for a very transparent letter, Leon. I do appreciate that. This is a recommendation that actually has a, a wee bit more to it than just uh, receiving. Um, and I just want us to very quickly uh, look at it um, because this is an area where we exercise a wee bit of um, uh, work as a committee that's but beyond just receiving. So obviously we will receive the report. Again, thank you for both your report, Sarah, and your letter, Leon. So it is that we approve the proposed spend on the fee of $136,596. Um, uh, which does exclude disbursements and GST. And that is the amount which, if I've got it right, is the 1.5% up on the prior year's fee and is consistent with the Auditor General's um, uh, express intent. Um, and that thirdly, we approve uh, Jim signing the audit proposal letter. Reasonably straightforward, but uh, it's important we, uh, we, we have got the delegate authority to essentially commit 
quite a chunk of money to getting this out of the way. So um, I'm quite comfortable as the chair to move this motion. Do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder? Yep. Oh, yep. Sorry, sorry, Roger, thank you. I was looking at the other end of the screen. There we go, my mistake. Um, so thank you, Roger, you second. I don't, again, I, don't, I think we've had a pretty good discussion on this. So I'd like to uh, put those um, three motions, A through C, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried, there we are. That's strong information. We've got you there, Leon, so thank you. And we do look forward to um, you working and communicating well with uh, Sarah and her team and vice versa as well. Sarah, again, thank you again for the, the good news that you've got a project group under underway. We need to move reasonably fast on to um, the rest of the agenda. I'd like to suggest that if we move this motion, move in public excluded, that um, some of you do a work just to make certain that we are all uncoupled um, and go into PX. I'd like to suggest that we take a five minute break um, if that's okay with everybody. Um, uh, so look, I'd like to move again from the chair that for the reasons that are stated in the uh, recommendation um, that the two items we have under public excluded be taken indeed and public excluded. Um, and just for clarity, uh, uh, Leon and Kat, you're welcome uh, from my perspective to remain for the meeting um, for that, that session. So uh, essentially public excluded. Could I have a seconder for that, my recommendation, please? Oh, I'll you, take you to. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. It's quarter past, according to me. Can we just